Um, so, my name is Alexis Rauch. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an IT director here at AMP, and I have the honour of introducing our fabulous guest from the UK, Simon Wardley. Um, first up, just a couple of housekeeping things. So, uh, oh, well, first up, a welcome to everybody. This is my first Amplify, so I'm hugely excited. I think it's such a privilege to be able to listen to all these terrific people, and that's certainly got my thought processes um, firing away and thinking about all the things about I want to do when I get back to, back to the office next week about how we might do things differently. I hope it's doing the same for you. So I really encourage you guys to be thinking not just through this session but throughout the whole week about um, what it means to you, what you might want to do differently, how do you get those thoughts kind of sparking back in the business, whether you're internal or external, I think it's just such a fabulous opportunity. Um, and please make the most of the various channels that we've got to communicate. Uh, we've got, you know, the team have set up channels across Twitter, Facebook, you know, you name it. You can probably engage through those channels uh, because it really is about continuing this whole theme. Uh, it would be such a shame not to kind of harness all this energy and enthusiasm and thoughts around innovation and take it back um, into our lives after this session. So I encourage you all to do that. Um, so I'm going to hand the baton over to our colleague uh, from CSC, uh, Matt Cudworth. He's going to introduce... Simon for us. Um, it's, uh, Matt is, is the CTO. He tells me the CTO of anything interesting, which excludes anything that's not interesting. I think that's what that means. Um, uh, at CSC in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and then we're going to hear um, a fascinating topic from Simon. But I'll hand the baton over to, over to you, Matt. Thank you. Um, so I think this marks the halfway point. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, can you all hear me clearly? Super. So, um, rewiring for value. Um, I'm going to start off with a quick warning, first of all. Um, I happen to like kitten pictures, so I will be using an awful lot of them during the presentation. Um, I'm also a scientist by training, so this is my kitten scientist. Uh, because I'm a scientist, I like graphs. So here's a quick graph. The level of audience pain, that's you, against the number of slides given in a 25-minute presentation. Now, I reckon there's a safe limit of about 20. Um, seeing I like to experiment, I'll be using no less than 192. I know what you're probably thinking, you know, death by PowerPoint. Um, but there will be plenty of signposts along the way. Now, I'm going to talk about mapping. How do you map a business a situational awareness? I'm going to talk about why it's important. Uh, how do you do this? Um, then I'm going to talk about, uh, so what? Why does it matter? Uh, talk a little bit about organizational learning, uh, gameplay, and then I'm going to summarize this all up. So before I start, a quick question. What do you think strategy is like in the boardrooms of most companies? Is it a game of chess? Or is it more like alchemy, gut feel, and a mixture of astrology? Um, <laughs> who's for, raise your hands if you're for a game of chess. No one. Oh, one. <laughs> okay. So, interesting. Uh, well, most of us are realists. Um, <laughs> so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the fact that so one of the problems that we have is um, very low levels of situational awareness in business. And I'm going to explain situational awareness through two examples. Uh, one's a thought experiment called Chess World, and one's a historical example called Thermopylae. So, I want you to imagine... You live in a world where everybody plays chess. And how well you play chess depends upon your sort of, uh, your ranking in this world, etc. But what's interesting is no one's ever seen a chess board. All you've ever seen are these characters on a screen. And you play the game of chess pretty simply by pressing one of the buttons, and your opponent sees what you've pressed, and they press a button, and so the game continues until, you know, it's either a draw or somebody wins. Now, what will happen is over time, people will collect all these sequences uh, from all these different games and start to 
discover magic secrets of success. So if you press the night button, I should rep uh, respond, you know, with pawn, pawn, rook, or something along those lines. And eventually, doesn't matter how many games you've collected, uh, you will play a game of chess against somebody who sees something magical. They see the actual board. And so you will do your sort of favorite moves, and all of a sudden, you've lost the game. Now, every time you will play this person, you will lose the game rapidly. And you'll start to sort of try and work out why is this. Is it the speed at which they're pressing the button? Maybe it's they had a good lunch. Maybe they're having a happy day. Well, the reality is you live in a low-level situational awareness environment. They have high levels of situational awareness. There's nothing you can do about it. You are always going to lose. Another example of situational awareness is um, the Battle of Thermopylae. So we'll go back to ancient Greece, uh, Themistocles, pol politician and general. He had a problem, which the Persians were invading the states of Greece. So he had a choice. I could defend around Athens, defend around Thebes. What he decided to do was uh, block off the Straits of Artemisium, uh, force the Persians along the coastal road, and then he would defend against the Persians in Thermopylae. Thermopylae. It's a sort of narrow pass. Have you heard of the story of the 300? Perfect. Right. So I want you to imagine um, it's the eve of battle. You're standing there, Themistocles is in front of you, and he says, I don't understand the landscape. I, I don't have a map of the environment. But don't worry, because I've created a swap diagram. <laughs> So strengths, a uh, well-trained Spartan army, you know, uh, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the uh, Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. Um, opportunities, get rid of the Persians, uh, get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian. We actually hate the Spartans. And uh, the threats, of course, is the Persians get rid of us. And the E4 says that, you know, a really dodgy film might be produced 2,000 years later. Okay. So what do you think is more effective in combat? A map or a SWOT diagram? A map. Map? Do you all agree a map? Good. Right. What do you use in business? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. So uh, maps, uh, boards are examples of what we call high-level situational awareness environments. So they often have visual reasoning. They're very context-specific. They talk about position and movement, so the position of pieces and how you move them. Um, Low-level situational awareness environments tend to use things like SWATs or stories. Uh, they tend to use secrets of success, lots of meme copying, uh, verbal reasoning, and little or no discussion of position and movement. Now, if you look in terms of military and you ask, you know, why does a general bombard a hill? They don't generally bombard a hill because 67% of other successful generals are bombarding hills, therefore that's a cool thing to do. And they don't bombard a hill because it makes a good story. Uh, they tend to use maps. Maps tell you where you can attack, position and movement. Then why is a relative statement? Why here over there? Then you're into the how, the what, and the when, which are action statements. So in terms of military, we talk about situational awareness in terms of where and why, and then we're on to the action, the how, what, and the when. So what's it like in business? Well, most companies have large strategy documents. And if you take those strategy documents and you rip out things like operational details, uh, uh, purchasing decisions, uh, implementation details, tactical choices like B OD, or bring your own disaster, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, this is all the sort of how, what, and when of action. Uh, the why we tend to do stuff is usually very vaguely described. It's very small. And when you get to, to it, the real reason is basically because everybody else is doing something. So everybody else has got a cloud strategy, big data strategy, digital first, IoT strategy. We better have one of those as well. Now, this sort of backward causality, if A is doing B and A is successful, we should copy them. Uh, this meme copying has been going on for ages. Um, anybody remember this book, In Search of Excellence? 62 companies for you to emulate, people like Kodak, <laughs> Atari. 
So I spent a bit of time going around to find out just how bad meme copying had become. Um, so I went to various events, collected lots of strategy documents, and looked for what I call business level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or BLAS for short. So here are the common BLAS. Digital business, you know, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, ecosystem, blah, 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 blah. And then I aggregated all these strategy documents and created a blah template. Uh, here it is. <laughs> our strategy is blah. We will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And so I took the common blahs and the blah template and auto-generated, purely by random, 64 different strategies. I thought we should go through them now. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> Our strategy is customer focus. Uh, we will lead a uh, disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based uh, ecosystem. It's totally random. Uh, number two, <laughs> our strategy is innovation. Well, I'm not going to go through them all, but you get the point. Um, so I sent them around, got about 300 responses, three basic forms. Uh, first one is, this is more or less the exact wording from our business plan. Uh, the second one, I've seen two of these used already. And my third and favorite is, are you for hire? <laughs> so a friend of mine put this all online. Um, so this is strategy as a service. So if you ever need, <laughs> just, just type in the URL and it will randomly generate you a strategy based upon what is the, the sort of uh, common means. Okay, so the issue is um, in business we tend to have a tyranny of action and low levels of situational awareness. So the question becomes, does it matter? So this is a study that I did back in 2012. It was uh, 160 um, high-tech companies uh, right at the edge of competition. And I looked at the level of strategic play, so that's uh, axis on the left, the y-axis, against the use of open as a way of manipulating a market and competing with others. And the bigger the bubbles, the more companies in that group. Now, the first thing to notice is the level of strategic play is not uniform. It turns out when you look at market cap, but those companies over a seven-year period in the top right-hand corner had very positive market cap changes, whereas those in the bottom left had stagnant or negative. So the point about this is that people often think action is more important than strategic play. It seems the data points the other way. I, it's important to shoot the gun, but it's even better to know where you're firing at. <laughs> So if you want to rewire an organization, you've somehow got to improve your level of strategic awareness and play and situational awareness of the environment that you exist in. So how do you do this? Well, organizations are complex things. Mass of people, practices, data activities, all bundled into one. And we try to understand them through what are called box and wire diagrams, things like this, business process map. Um, or Things like this, an IT systems diagram. Have you all seen one of these? Great, super. Um, so this actually is Google self-driving car. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think your strategy should be for a world perception server? Does anybody in the room have any idea what a world perception server is? Right, no. Um, problem with these diagrams, they give you no context. But even worse... Uh, the business and IT tend to use different diagrams to describe the same organization so no one can actually effectively communicate. So many years ago, uh, I was CEO of a software company. Um, we got bought out by uh, Canon. It's the fourth startup I've done. One was bought by Dell, one Canon, one EMC. Um, I wanted to turn my organization into a map so we could all discuss the environment. Now, I knew the organization consisted of value chains, and being a Brit, I, I like to talk about things in terms of cup of teas. So I'm going to use a cup of tea to explain this. Um, if I think about a user, a user's need is for a cup of tea, uh, in my case. But a cup of tea has needs. It needs tea, it needs uh, hot water, it needs a mug. And hot water has needs, it needs kettle, it needs cold water. And kettle has needs, it needs power. So you can create a chain of needs from the visible user needs to the components that you need to uh, provide that. Now, 
What I did was I took one of our small lines of business, 10 million users, 100 terabytes of data, this is 2005, and we turned it into a value chain, very simplified form. This gave me position, so a relationship between the components, but it gave me no concept of movement. And that's a problem. Because if I look at somebody like Nokia, started off as a paper mill, became a plastics manufacturer, then became a telecommunications company, now it's becoming something different. So I need to have an idea of how things are changing. Now, we know things appear and they diffuse in society. Um, have you all heard of Everett Rogers' uh, diffusion of innovation? No? So they diffuse through society through a common pattern, early adopters all the way to the sort of mass market and then to laggards. Uh, the problem is these S-curve shaped diffusion curves are all different shapes in terms of the size of the markets are completely different, the time span is completely different. So there's, there's not a uniform one. Fortunately, when things appear, like the telephone, it diffuses, new and improved versions appear, and they diffuse. And so with electricity, you start off with things like the Parthian battery, 400 AD. Over time, 1886, you get utility provision of electricity. So everything seems to evolve. So I did a piece of work about 10 years ago which looked at how things evolved. And there turns out to be a common pattern. If you look at the ubiquity and certainty, so you abolish time, you look at ubiquity and certainty of something, you start off with the genesis of something, novel and new, poorly understood, rare, then you get custom-built examples, then products, then rental services, then it becomes more of a commodity and you get utility services. So if you take electricity, you start off with a Parthian battery, you end up with uh, custom-built systems like the Hippolyte Pixie, and then you get Siemens generators and eventually Westinghouse Tesla utility provision of electricity. If you take computing, you start off with the Z3, 1943, custom-built systems like Leo, uh, the first products, IBM 650, rental services like Timshare, commodity hardware, and eventually utility services like cloud. Now, Correlation is one thing, you need causation. What drives this all is simply competition. So if you think of competition like a cat fight, every time anybody gains some sort of advantage, some new big gun like e-commerce, everybody else wants to follow suit. And so what you have is demand competition uh, for anything which is useful, which drives ubiquity. But at the same time, vendors want to supply the stuff. And so somebody will introduce a new thing like kit and body armor, and of course somebody else will make a better version. So what you have is demand and supply competition drive the process of evolution. Now I've got two things now. I've got a value chain which describes position in an organization, and I've got evolution which describes movement and change. So I can combine those two together. So that's what I did back in 2005. I took our value chain, simply flattened that evolution curve at the bottom. So Genesis, custom-built product to more commodity. Simply put things where they were. And that was the first map I produced in 2005, and that gave me position and movement. So what? Sounds like a complete waste of time. Well, many years ago, I wrote something called the Better for Less paper uh, for the Conservative Party before... Uh, the first coalition was formed. And this better and less paper I wrote with a friend of mine, Liam Maxwell, and several others, it talks about how to transform UK government IT. Now, one of the things that we thought was very important was the focus on user needs. Uh, Liam is actually the CTO for UK government these days. So if I take a project like Emergency Services Mobile Communication Platform, uh, this is all the radios, telecommunication for the police, ambulance, and so forth. It's a fairly critical project. If you ask them what the user need was, they have a 300-page specification document. It's somewhere in there, but no one could actually describe it. So what they did was they mapped it out in an afternoon. I'm afraid I had to remove the terms that are sensitive for what each of the nodes are. And the user need becomes really simple. It's the stuff at the top, because that's where you start with mapping. The second thing mapping is useful for is dealing with change. So what happens is if you've got a line of business, everything in your business is evolving due to competition. And it all starts off on the left-hand side, 
which is this uncharted space. It's novel, it's new, it's uncertain. It has all these sorts of characteristics of being unpredictable. You have to experiment. Doesn't matter whether it's money, penicillin, computing, whatever. Then over time it evolves and becomes more industrialized, ordered, standard, you know, measured, dull. Now, because of this polar opposite, this is why there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all management. Do you know what agile development is? Right, it's very good for the uncharted space, but it sucks uh, for the industrialized compared to things like Six Sigma. And lean happens to be extremely good in the middle. So what happens is that impacts management. So you take a heavy engineering project like HS2, High Speed Rail. This is a 70 billion pound UK government project. This is how they try to organize it, with box and wire diagrams. What they did is they mapped out the entire environment. And once you map it out, they go, well, we can use uh, outsource, we use much more Six Sigma, utility services on one side, off-the-shelf products, much more lean in the middle, agile in-house development on the left-hand side. And by doing this, this gets away from the sort of tyranny of single methods, the yo-yo that happens. We're all Six Sigma. No, we're all Agile. No, we're all Six Sigma. And it also gets away from the tendency to outsource entire large-scale projects, <laughs> which what happens when you outsource them, the industrialized bits get treated efficiently, but you always get hammered with change control costs um, for those novel sort of components because they change by their very nature and the sort of methods and contracts you apply are usually not suitable. The other thing it's useful for is collaboration. So if you take somebody like uh, borders, uh, border control in the UK and immigration and the National Police Database, what you find is there's common elements in all of them. So in the Home Office, 25 major projects covering police and so forth, there are all these common components which we normally rebuild every single time. So we go Everybody needs a decision support system. So we'll have 25 of those. Well, we don't have to do that anymore because we know that these are common components and we can actually have one team in the home office build them for everybody else. Now, before you think government is really bad at duplication and waste, the best example of waste and duplication I have comes from the private sector. 380 is the number to remember. So. This one particular global company has 380 customized ERP systems all doing exactly the same thing. So 380 teams all customizing the same thing, and it is even the same system. So government is bad, but believe me, if you want bureaucracy and you want waste, private sector is, is actually far better. Uh, so quick recap, um, most organizations exist in low-level situational awareness environments. Um, you can actually improve this by turning your organization into a map. You do this by looking at value chain and evolution, combine them together, produce a map like this. They're good for focusing on things like user needs, applying the right sort of methods, um, collaboration. In fact, there's a whole range of things, contract management, risk management, team structure that you can use them for. Okay, so learning. One of the best things about maps is when you change something on a map, you can learn what works and what doesn't. So you've got position and movement, you've got a line of business, you know that everything's going to evolve. And what happens is when things evolve and become more of a commodity, quite surprisingly, new things appear that are built on top of them. There are all sorts of repeatable economic patterns. So competition drives something to a more efficient state, but it also increases the agility which we can build new things and creates new sources of value and worth. So, for example, electricity enables things like lighting, radio, television, and computing, and of course those have all commoditized today. This has gone on throughout history. Electricity enabling computing, enabling analytics, enabling intelligent software agents. Now, one of the interesting things is, well, another common pattern is we have inertia to change. And that inertia comes from past success. And inertia is a killer. So Kodak. Contrary to popular belief, when we went from analog to digital, Kodak was out innovating the market. They were first in with digital still cameras, first in with online photo services. Unfortunately, they had inertia created by their fulfillment systems, which were based upon analog Im images, so film processing. 
Anybody want to guess who was first with video online on demand? Blockbuster or Netflix? Blockbuster. What do you think took down Blockbuster? <coughs> hmm? The stores. Yeah, absolutely. They, that's what created the inertia. Okay. So once you have a map of an environment, and once you learn some of the basic economic patterns, and there are about 13 different ones, you can start to do gameplay. So you've got a line of business. You know it's going to evolve. You know it's going to create components. You've got multiple points of where you can attack. Should I attack here? Should I attack there? Or so forth. You even have the ability to now influence the market. So this becomes, you know, can I manipulate it in some way? Now, there are 61 different ways of manipulating a market. You can open source something, drive it to more of a commodity. You can use constraints to limit the rate of evolution. There's all sorts of ecosystem games you can play, and I do not have time to go through them, or so you are saved from that. But I will tell you one, fool's mate. So this is a map of a media company. And at the very top is the customer. The user need is leisure time. It's got choices. It can go through an aggregated site like Netflix or through a branded site like something like Channel 4. Now, that site needs content, and that content uh, they actually create. And content has a pipeline, shows a commission, but over time they become acquired formats, like X Factor you know, suddenly becomes X Factor Australia, X Factor US, etc. Now, their problem is this. Their branded site depends upon, as a differentiator, the content they have. And their content depends upon their artistic direction. Unfortunately, content is really expensive to produce. Creative studios aren't cheap, because there's a limited number. So ideally, for this commissioning TV service, they want to drive um, creative studios to more of a commodity. But unfortunately, when you turn up and say to a creative studio, we'd like you to be more of a commodity and cheaper, uh, they tend to have inertia to that idea. It's, it's not in their interest. Well, fortunately, creative studios have a constraint in terms of production talent and production systems. So what you can do is you can drive production systems to more of a commodity. Now, vendors in that space have inertia, and of course, you can use an open approach to do this. So the question I have for you is, do you think creative um, uh, studios will oppose you in doing this? If you said, we're going to take production systems and make them more of a commodity and reduce your cost of producing shows, what do you think creative studios will feel about it? Good idea or bad idea? Good idea. Great, they support you. What is the effect of actually commoditizing production systems on creative studios? Yeah, it commoditizes them as well. So the point about this is when you have a map, there are multiple places to attack. And if you want to commoditize creative studios, what you do is you attack the underlying systems because they'll help you do so, and it has exactly the same effect. So you have multiple places of attack, and why now is why here over there? Well, it's always better to get your opponent to help you. So this is how you go in business from basically having a tyranny of action to focusing on situational awareness, so where you can attack and why one over another. So I'm going to quickly summarize some things here by just explaining the impact. So back in 2008, um, I used to run strategy for a company called Canonical. Have you all heard of Ubuntu? Some of you have, right. So we mapped out the environment. And we are a team of 300 people. This is Ubuntu. It's an operating system. And we were against massive giants, Red Hat, Microsoft. We were less than 2% of the market. But we mapped it out and worked out where to attack. I spent less than half a million. And remember, cloud is a multi-billion dollar market. We took over 70% of the market within a year and a half. And we managed to do so because we were playing chess and our opponents weren't. It was as simple as that. So how to rewire. Um, the first thing, focus on user needs. Most critical thing to do. Second, understand your value chain. The third thing is understand the context. So you start to map the environment. Once you start having maps, then it becomes easy to sort of learn common economic patterns, start playing games with the environment, and you can work out what works and what doesn't. Um, my last word on this 
is when it comes to mapping, I'm afraid the only people who can map a business are people within the business. So you can't actually get anybody from outside to map it for you. You have to do it yourself. So it is one of these no consultant areas. Uh, the entire technique is all Creative Commons as well. Um, so you can find it online. And so that's me. I'm two minutes over. My apologies. Thank you very much. <laughs>